Luke chapter 17. There comes a time and an event from time to time that will challenge your walk with the Lord, uh, challenge your walk with God. It'll challenge your faith. Uh, those are called offenses. Uh, those of the, the word offenses come from a word that means a trap. It's a, it's a snare. It's something that's, that could throw you off of your walk with the Lord. And for many people in Brownwood, Texas, one of those offenses came this past week. A lot of people are asking why it had to be Lieutenant Stone, why at the ball game, why in front of his son. And it's uh, one of those situations where it is just an event that is hard to come to grips with. It's hard to understand why God would allow something like that to happen. Events like this, they either drive you closer to God or they pull you further away from God. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you all about this morning. Luke chapter 17 and verse 1, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Jesus had just finished telling the story of the rich man who went to hell and Lazarus who went to Abraham, who was comforted in Abraham's bosom, that, the, uh, that Lazarus had gone to heaven. And he had just addressed that, and he had addressed the Pharisees' greed and hypocrisy, their covetousness, and their, their dark hearts and their hardened hearts. And he warned them that the path that they were on was taking them to hell. Now Jesus has turned his attention from the Pharisees, and he's turned to his disciples, and he's teaching them to watch out for these traps, to watch out for these things that affect their walk with the Lord, to watch out for temptations, to watch out for problems and trials and tribulations, he teaches them to watch out for things that could affect their spiritual walk. He teaches them about forgiveness, and he teaches them about faith. First thing I want to look at this morning is offenses will come. Offenses will come. Verse 1 says, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. That means it is impossible, but that offenses will come. In other words, you can't go through life without offenses coming. Now, what's an offense? An offense is a snare. It's a trap. It's a setup. It's a temptation. It's a problem. It's a time that you might feel that you've been set up for failure. That's an offense. That's a snare. That's a trap. It is something that is designed to, to trip you up. And those are going to happen in life. There will always be temptations. There will always be problems. There will always be opportunities to stumble. There will always be scandals. There will always be scandals tied into the church. The, the church is all, There's always going to be problems that happen at church. And when these things happen, it's important not to be discouraged. Don't give in to the temptations. Don't give in to the traps. You'll be tempted with things that are very appealing to you but are very sinful. Don't give in to those. They're going to happen. They're going to come. The, the, Satan is going to throw these things at you. But don't give in to them. There are going to be things that happen in your life that make you wonder why God is allowing things to happen. And you're going to, you're going to feel discouraged. And you're going to feel like, well, maybe God doesn't care. And why do I bother worshiping the Lord? And why do I bother trying to walk with the Lord? And why do I bother praying to the Lord when it doesn't seem to do any good? And that's an offense. That's a trap. That's a temptation that, that Satan is laying out in front of you for the purpose of getting you to quit walking with the Lord. You can't lose your salvation but Satan can definitely neutralize you to where you're not doing anything good for the Lord and when you're not doing anything good for yourself and you're not doing anything good for your family. When these offenses come, and they're going to come, when these traps come, when these snares come, when these problems come, and when they come, the thing to remember is that these, Jesus told us that these things were going to happen. They're part of the Christian life. They're part of the Christian walk. Don't get offended. 
And don't leave the Lord's side. Don't leave your walk with the Lord. And don't leave the Lord's work. Don't leave the church. Churches have problems. Churches have problems because churches have people. And as long as churches have people, then churches will have problems. Why? Because people are sinners. People have the sin nature. So as long as people have the sin nature and people are in churches, and churches will have problems because churches are full of people with sin problems. And there's going to be problems. But don't get discouraged by those problems. Brownwood is full of people who got offended and quit coming to church. People who got offended by something. People who were discouraged by a problem. People whose feelings had gotten hurt at church. And sometimes those feelings were hurt for a good and legitimate reason. Uh, th that happens. But people get discouraged and they quit going to church. And when they quit going to church, they quit their walk with the Lord. Well, but Leland, isn't it possible to have a relationship with the Lord outside of church? It's, it's entirely necessary to have a relationship with the Lord outside of church. But when you have a relationship with the Lord and you don't have a church, you don't go to church, you don't fellowship with church, then what happens is you don't have that encouragement that you should be getting from being a part of a church. And when you don't have that encouragement, and that's why we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25, it's not just because thus saith the Lord, but it's because the reason we come together should be to gain encouragement. And when you don't have that encouragement from a church family, you're going to find it awful hard to maintain a walk with the Lord, to maintain a relationship with the Lord, because Satan is constantly throwing those offenses in your way to, to turn you off of your walk. Brownwood is full of people that got offended and quit coming to church. I cannot tell you how many people I have met that they used to go to church, and they were a member of this and so church. And some of the people I have met are very knowledgeable in the Bible. They spent a lot of time at this and so church, and they were very faithful servants at this and so church. But then something happened, and they got their feelings hurt, many times with good reason, and they don't go to church anymore. And they haven't been going to church, and they haven't been in the Lord's word, they haven't been in his work, they haven't been bringing their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and then they wonder why they have some of the uh, family problems that they have, because Satan is sitting there throwing those problems in their path, and there is not a church there to pray for them, to pray that the Lord intercedes, there is not a church there to encourage them, and they stay in a continual state of being tripped up. But they don't want to come back to church because they've been offended. And so what we learned from verse 1 so far is that offenses are going to come. It's impossible to go through life without offenses coming. Do not be discouraged by those offenses. Do not give in to the temptation that those offenses cause. Verse 1 goes on to say, But woe unto him through whom they come. Oftentimes these offenses, these traps, these temptations, they come through a particular individual. Somebody brings them in. Somebody causes it to happen. You know, I find it interesting. I used to find it interesting back when I was in East Texas, and there would be a church that would have a problem, and there would be a big split in the church, and people would leave the church. And a church that was running 100 people one Sunday, a few weeks later, it was only running about 25 people in morning worship because there was a lot of controversy in the church, and there were a lot of splits in the church. And somebody would say something like, well, Satan just got in there and tore it up. Satan wouldn't have the power to do that if people didn't cooperate with him. And, you know, I also found that some of the same people who are saying Satan got in there and tore it up were some of the same people who were cooperating with Satan to get in there and tear it up. We have to be careful that what we are doing is not causing an offense now remember an offense is a it's a snare it's a trap it is a it is something that scandalizes it is something that tempts it is something that causes people to fall away god will deal with the person who brings the offense god will deal with those who lead others to sin you know you might be able to think that you can do something and it not be sin you know, you might think that you can watch a certain type of movie and it not be sin. Or you might be able to think that you can drink a certain beverage and it not be sin. But what about the person who's drinking that beverage or watching that film with you? Now, you might be able to do it and not sin. But what if they go off the deep end and they're sinning now? You know, somebody will say, well, the Bible doesn't forbid drinking. The Bible just forbids being drunk. So I can drink a beer. Well, what about the person you're drinking the beer with? Will they stop at one? Or will they go on and get drunk? That's, that's an offense. 
We're not talking about getting upset because somebody didn't compliment you on your new blouse. We're, we're, we're not talking about being offended because somebody parked in your parking space, which we don't really have that problem here because we have plenty of parking spaces and plenty of seats in the church pews. And the only controversy we seem to have is over McDonald's french fries at certain after church fellowships. But we'll leave that, we'll let that be. Those who lead others to sin, those who create scandal, are ones who are bringing offenses in the church. Those who are bringing offenses in the lives of other believers. How do you create scandal? You spread rumors. You spread rumors, you bear false witness, or by stirring up controversy. People like to stir up controversy. I've known some people. Some of them have been part of this congregation who liked to stir up controversy. If there wasn't a controversy going on, they didn't know how to handle things because you have to have a controversy to stand on truth. No, you don't have to have a controversy to stand on truth. You can, lit you can just proclaim the truth without having to stir up a fight about it. But when someone is stirring up controversy or they're spreading rumors or they're spreading false witness, they're creating scandal. They are creating an offense. They are bringing an offense in. And what's so bad about this is that offense drives people away from God's word. It drives people away from the gospel. It drives people away from the fellowship with the church and the fellowship with other believers. And God takes this very seriously. The Bible says, but woe unto him through whom they come. In verse 2, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. God will deal with the offender very drastically. It says that um, it says that it would better for him that a millstone were tied around his neck and that he be cast to the bottom of the sea. I had a friend one time who said that they should do this to the uh, to the people who hurt children, and they should televise it. Now I don't know if I'll go that far with him, but when you get to the judgment and you've spent a lifetime dragging people away from God, dragging people away from his word, dragging people away from the fellowship with other believers, dragging people into bad influences. When you've spent your life doing those things, when you get to the judgment, you're going to wish that you had drowned in the bottom of the sea by the time God gets through with you. So be aware of offenses and don't be the offender. Don't be the one who causes other people to stumble in their walk with the Lord. And be aware of offenses. Don't be derailed or discouraged by offenses. Don't be derailed or discouraged by problems that come up in life, by temptations that come up in life, by tragedies that come up in life. And don't bring, be the one who brings the offenses into the church or into the lives of other people. You know, oftentimes we get annoyed with each other because we're not acting the way each other thinks that we ought to be acting. We, we do things differently. We think in different ways. And Romans chapter 14 teaches that we ought to leave each other alone. As, he, as the Bible says in Romans 14, Who art thou that, ju that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. He is able to stand, yea, because the Lord is able to make him stand. And so I'm walking with the Lord, and I'm praying to the Lord, and I'm trying to do what the Lord has called me to do, and I'm trying to do that to the best of my understanding of what the Lord's called me to do. And you're walking with the Lord, and you're praying to the Lord, and you're trying to walk with the Lord as best as you understand how to walk with the Lord, and you're trying to do what God has called you to do to the best of your understanding of how to do what God has called you to do. And we may be doing those things differently. But God has called people to different things. And we ought not to be trying to conform each other to our own personal image. Now, there are doctrinal issues that we do need to conform on. We do need to conform on salvation by grace through faith apart from works. We do need to conform on that. We do need to conform on what proper baptism is, on what the proper observance of the Lord's Supper is, on whether or not you can lose your salvation or not. We do need to be on the same page that salvation, once saved, always saved, that God has secured our salvation. We do need to be on the same page about that. We do need to be on the same page that the Bible is the word of God, and it's the final authority because it's God's written word. This, this is the stuff that God put into writing. We need to be on the same page about that. But when it comes to how we dress, how we, how we dress, what we listen to, how we uh, 
how we have our houses arranged, whether we cook vegetables or whether we cook meats or any of those things, whether we grew up in the city or whether we grew up in the country, we need to leave that to the individual. So be aware, offenses are going to come, problems are going to come, scandals are going to come, disagreements are going to come, splits are going to come, things are going to happen. Don't be discouraged by them. Don't be the one that brings it in. Second thing I want to look at this morning is forgiveness. Verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. First thing this verse says is take heed to yourselves. That means you need to watch yourself. You need to watch yourself. Don't allow yourself to become angry or bitter. It's uh, not healthy for you. I remember... When I pastored at Denson Springs, I got so angry with some of those people. I got so angry, I literally made myself sick. I had back aches and fevers and headaches, and I was having to take Tylenol, and it wasn't really helping that much. And why? Because I had allowed myself to become angry and to become bitter. Why had I allowed myself to be angry or bitter? Because I hadn't done what the Bible says. It says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If you allow yourself to become angry and bitter and you're not working out the conflict and you're just going to sit there and harbor it all up, that's how offenses come. Because eventually you're going to lose it and you're going to bring it an offense. And so Jesus says, he says, it's impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through who they come. So you need to watch yourselves. And if your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Now this is where we often fall short. The Bible says if your brother or sister in Christ does something that offends you, let them know. Let them know. Rebuke them. Now, you need to do it lovingly. You're not doing it out of anger. You're not doing it out of malice. You're not doing it out of demand. You're not doing it to put them in their place. But if something they have done is causing a breakage and fellowship between you and them, you need to let them know. I'm having an awful hard time with this. And you don't use it as a manipulation tool. You know, some people... I love you, so I'm going to tell you how you've offended me. And everything you've done has offended them. You know, you, you just everything you've done has offended them. You didn't dust the end tables at your house before you invited them over. That's offended them. You know, it can get manipulative. You don't want to, let, you, you don't want to do that either. But if your brother or sister has actually done something that has actually offended you, you need to let them know. Oftentimes we grow angry with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they don't even know they've offended us. We need to work that out. If you do something that's offended me, I need to let you know what you have done has offended me. This is, this is hurting me. This is bothering me. And if I've done something that's offended you, you need to tell me that you have done this. You, this has offended me. This has hurt me. This is why this has hurt me. And then I will do what I can to repent. Now I've run into that mentality. You know, what you are doing is offending me. It is hurting me. Well, that's just who I am. You've got to put up with it. That's not a godly attitude. I have dealt with people who will sit there and they will offend you and hurt you and derail you and insult you every way possible. And then when you say you've offended me, they're offended that you had the audacity to be offended. That's not godly. But if your brother trespass against thee, if your brother does something against you, something that actually hurts you, then you need to rebuke them. You need to let them know that this, that this has hurt me, that this has offended me. And if they repent, then you forgive them, and it's over. And that's the goal of the confrontation. The confrontation is not so you can tell them how they've done something totally rotten and how rotten of a person they are. And your goal is not to defeat them or to overcome them. Your goal is reconciliation. If we have an argument and I go to you, my goal is to reconcile. The goal of the confrontation is always for repentance and reconciliation, to be reunited so that you can go on fellowshipping together. If your brother trespass against you, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And verse 4 says, if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. In other words, forgive a lot. Forgive often. Be a forgiving person. 
And you know what? If you're a forgiving person, you're not going to find yourself being offended awful, awful lot. If you are a forgiving person, you're not going to be offended by every little thing. And that's something we have to watch out for because oftentimes we can say, okay, the right thing to do is to have the confrontation. The next thing you know, we're having a confrontation every five minutes about every little thing. No, we need to realize that there are some things we can let the water just run under the bridge. But if this is something that has actually been hurtful to you and you rebuke them and they repent, then forgive them. And if this happens over and over again, if, 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 if you're constantly finding yourself having to forgive somebody, keep forgiving them. Now think about it. How many times in a day does God forgive you? Amen. How many times in an hour does God forgive you? How many times in a day are you asking God to forgive you? Are you repenting of something? How many times do you find yourself repenting of the same sin over and over again? And, and, you, and you ask God to forgive you of the same sin over and over again. And what does God do? The Bible says he is, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess them before him. God forgives us a lot. He extends a lot of grace to us. We should extend that grace to each other. And so what we've talked about this morning so far is we've talked about offenses. We've talked about trials. We've talked about problems. We've talked about griefs. We've talked about traps. We've talked about pitfalls. And if they're going to come and people are going to bring them to us and people are going to set us up for failure, we need to watch them, not be distracted by them, not be derailed by them, and we need to not be the person that brings them in. And then we need to forgive the person that brings them in. We need to forgive the person that trespasses against us. And we need to be a forgiving person. Don't be distracted. Don't be discouraged. Don't be angry. Forgive. You're probably saying the same thing the apostles are saying in verse 5. That's going to take a lot of faith. Verse 5, the apostles say, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. So he sat here and he told them, it is impossible, but offenses are going to come. And woe unto him through who they come. And... Be forgiving to one another. If your brother trespass against thee, forgive, and forgive often. Seven times in a day, forgive. And they're saying, wow, this is, this is kind of hard stuff to deal with. Uh, Lord, increase our faith. That's the third thing I want to talk to you about this morning is faith. Faith is a deep-rooted trust and conviction of the truth of the Lord, of the truth of his existence, and a deep-rooted trust in his grace and his salvation through Jesus Christ. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. The apostles knew that it would take a lot of faith to live up to the principles that Jesus was teaching. Just the act of forgiveness requires faith because you're trusting God to protect you from further harm. You're trusting God to work the situation out. It takes a lot of faith to forgive somebody who's truly hurt you. And there, there are some of y'all that y'all have been truly hurt. And it's, it's, it's hard to forgive. It's hard to overcome that. But it takes a lot of faith to do that. But the apostles asked for the faith. And you know what? You can ask for the faith too. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Sycamine trees, not to be confused with sycamore trees, sycamine trees had very strong root systems. And because of their strong root systems, they were impossible to pluck up. Back in East Texas, we had pine trees. And some of those pine trees were easy to pluck up. Some of them, not so much. There's a tree stump in the back of my grandfather's pasture that they have cut at the roots. They had borrowed bulldozers to try to push it over. They had set it on fire, borrowed a bulldozer again to push it over. That, tree, that, that stump is still there. Um, there are trees that are very hard to pluck up, and you can probably identify with that. And it's impossible to plant a tree in the sea. Now think about that. Be thou plucked up and be thou planted in the sea. Can y'all picture planting a tree in the sea? It doesn't really work, does it? This is, this is impossible. But Jesus said if you had the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could do it. You could say unto this tree, be thou plucked up and be thou planted in the sea. If you just have the faith as a mustard seed, if you, have the if you have a mustard seed's amount of faith, and a mustard seed is very, very small. If you ever get your hamburger and it's got those sesame seeds on the bun, okay? Mustard seed is smaller than a sesame seed. So you're, we're dealing with a very small amount of faith it takes here. If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto that sycamine tree, be thou plucked up and be thou planted in the sea. they are saying, Leland, this is making no sense whatsoever. I mean, I know it's in the Bible, but you're, you're, you're talking gibberish now. What Jesus is saying is if you have 
a little bit of faith, if you have just a minute amount of faith, that things that were impossible are now possible with God. So God may have called you to do something impossible, like forgive your brother, or to overcome an offense, or to overcome pain and heartache. Or to continue to walk with him even though everything around you is falling apart. He may have called you to do something impossible. But if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, it is now possible. And you can forgive your brother. And you can continue to walk with the Lord even though things are happening bad all around you. Even though offenses are all around you. And you don't need a lot of faith, mind you. Just a mustard seed amount of faith. Just trust God. And you know what? You might be saying, well, I still don't know. Where can I get that kind of faith? That's the good thing is you can ask God for the faith. Verse 5, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Faith is a spiritual gift. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but now abide faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Three spiritual gifts there, faith, hope, and love. We talk about love being a spiritual gift. We talk about hope being a spiritual gift. Faith is also a a spiritual gift. God can give you the faith if you ask for it. But if you ask for it, you need to be willing to take it. You need to be willing to go get it. How do you do that? By studying the word. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to see your faith grow? Ask the Lord for faith, but then open up your Bible and start reading and start learning of the Lord. And the more you learn of him, the more you'll be able to trust him. It takes a lot of faith to walk the Christian life. It takes a lot of faith to be able to move forward, even though things are going badly. It takes a lot of faith to keep walking with the Lord, even though you are facing a very hard time of bereavement. Because I know in my life, when times of when things have happened that have sent me into a state of bereavement or into a state of mourning, when I've lost loved ones, when I've lost friends that have been close to me, the uh, the the desire is to just kind of like the turtle goes back in his shell, you just kind of want to just kind of re- recuse yourself from everything and just kind of lock yourself in the house and, or maybe leave town for a little bit and just get away from everything and not have any interaction with anybody. And oftentimes the Lord is on the list of the people that you don't want to interact with. You just want to be left alone for a little while and hurt and have your meltdown and then get over it. And that's kind of what you want to do. But The Bible teaches that we need to have faith so that when those things happen, when those offenses happen, when those problems happen, when those trials and tribulations happen, that we don't recuse ourselves from the Lord, whether we continue to rely on him. But if you're going to do that, you're going to have to have trust in him. And it's hard to trust him when things are going badly, but you need to trust him enough to know that he sees the big picture. And I remember, this is going to sound stupid in light of everything that we've seen this week, but I remember when I played football, I was on the defensive line, and every now and then we would be, as a defensive lineman, you'd be double teamed. Two linemen would, would block you at once. And the purpose of that was for the, so the offensive line could open up a hole and the running back could run through there and score a touchdown. And you knew when the double team happened, you might not have seen it, but you could feel the world coming down on you. And coach taught us that when you when when you felt that second blocker hit you, take a knee, fall down, and what you'll do is you'll create a huge pile of humanity that the running back can't run through. It's not fun being on the bottom of that pile. It hurts. It is a painful experience. I don't know, coach, if I can trust you with this with this bit of with this bit of instruction, but coach sees the big picture. If there's a pile of people there, that running back's not going anywhere. And so you had to you had to For lack of a better term, take that one for the team. The Lord allows us to go through pain, but there is always a bigger picture. You say, well, how can there be a bigger picture to the things that have happened in my life? How can there be a bigger picture to the passing of uh, Lieutenant Shannon Stone? How can there be a bigger picture to the passing of my loved one? How can there be a bigger picture to the pain that I'm experiencing right now. You would be surprised at how many things God can work out simultaneously with one event. Now I'm going to tell you, the Bible teaches, and we will, we're studying this in the book of Job on Sunday nights, when God allows you to go through those 
trials and tribulations, when he allows you to endure those offenses, it is never without cause. And it is never without reward. God is not just putting you through suffering just so he can enjoy the honor and glory, just so he can claim a victory, just so he can jump up and down and say, hurrah, look at me. He is working something out, not only in your life, but in the lives of other people who might also be affected by this situation. And if you are submissive to him as you go through this and you continue to fully rely on him as you go through this, when you come out on the other side, God's going to have a reward there. I can't tell you when you're going to receive that reward. I can, I, can tell, I can tell you when you receive the eternal reward of that is when you pass on from this life. But in this life, I cannot tell you when you'll receive that reward or what that reward will look, at, look like. But I will tell you that I, have, I, I see it in the scriptures. I see it in my life. I see it in the lives of others. When God allows you to go through trials and tribulations on the other side of that, there is a payoff. Fully rely on God. So we go through times that are uncertain. We go through times that we struggle, times that we suffer. Continue to fully rely on God to pull you through those. Let's stand. We'll have a hymn of invitation.